Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree? Back in 1776, someone said, Give me coffee or give me death. And if that's how you feel, you should be at the Organic Man Coffee Trike. They make coffee the right way, one delicious cup at a time. 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. Coffee, the stuff dreams are made of. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. With us tonight is Lex Lonehood Nover. He has been a web producer for Coast to Coast AM, America's most popular overnight radio show since 2002. His work is considered a valuable resource for anyone studying the paranormal, fringe science, and alternative theories. If you listen to Coast to Coast, you may have heard the name Lex Lonehood at the end of each show. Welcome to Strange Things. Chris, thanks so much for having me on your, your podcast. I appreciate your uh, being able to come on yourself. You well, sa- my pleasure. You said in the book that back in 1999, you were listening to Coast to Coast on the radio there, and you were in New York, I believe? Yes. At that time, did you have the slightest indication or inkling that you would ever actually be working on the show no i mean at that point i i I, well actually i was writing for their magazine at that point i started writing for after dark which Mm. was the print magazine that was affiliated with art bell right around that time end of 98 99 so i had some affiliation but i i didn't you know i was basically a freelancer so i didn't didn't really realize that uh, I would end up becoming the web producer when George Norrie took over, because that was a few years uh, down the road when mm. Art officially retired. What was it that you were doing for the show? You said you were the uh, magazine writer? Yeah, I was one of the, the main writers for the magazine. Basically, uh, I was doing kind of what, what you're doing with me, uh, in- interviewing people and uh, writing up... Uh, articles uh, profiling different people that were on the show or just different uh, adventures I might have, like going on some ghost hunting experience and different things that kind of related to the themes of Coast to Coast. And how did and you... a few years... Hmm. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you're... Go ahead. I was just going to say, a few years earlier, I'd gotten a grant when I lived in San Francisco to create a web magazine for the San Francisco Chronicle, so I'd gotten some background in in the uh, internet, which was really just getting launched around that time, end of ninety five, ninety six. And so when this opportunity arose for coast to coast, I kind of had a good combination of skills in terms of being able to write about the topics for the magazine, but also having that background in in the internet. Was thing to the show considered part of your job? Uh, once uh, once I, I became the, the web producer, mm-hmm. absolutely, yeah, because uh, one of the uh, big things that I do is uh, recapping the show. I wanted to kind of give a journalistic uh, flair to the website in terms of what was covered on the show, because a lot of radio shows, it's just you kind of hear it in the moment and then it's done, or you can get uh, recordings of the show, but I thought it was uh, a, a kind of a, a great idea to be able to have somewhat, n- not a transcript, but some of the highlights that the guests were talking about, and it could really uh, become its own thing in a way for people to research and look back on. In fact, I even used <laughs> some of my recaps for research with my book. Hmm. It must have been interesting to be able to tell people you get paid to listen to coast to coast (laughs) yeah it's really been a dream job for Mm. me because of my interests in 
the paranormal and the unusual, and then also writing and photography. So really, everything just came together for this this really unique job, and I just <laughs> feel so lucky to to have gotten it, and I've uh, been doing it for the last 17 years. Hmm. What got you interested in the paranormal? I think I've always had a fascination for things that were bizarre, like that uh, web magazine that I mentioned that I did in the mid-90s was called Offbeat, so I was looking at uh, kind of eccentric and unusual topics in, in culture and things like UFOs and just different things that were sort of kind of really percolating in, in that uh, 90s period with the popularity of the X-Files and, and things like that. But, yeah, I just, just have this sort of perpetual fascination with mysteries and the unexplained. And how about the subject of nightmares? Where did uh, that indication first pop up where you thought, I should write a book about this? Well, really, uh, the the book kind of exploded out from the idea of sleep paralysis, which I've had a couple of episodes of, and it's such an unusual state that um, that's really known since antiquity, and it it has spawned all of this supernatural lore and and mythos around it, and yet at the same time there are neurobiological explanations as well. So I just thought it was a really interesting uh, kind of coming together of, of a lot of different things in terms of the supernatural and and science and medical stuff. So that kind of uh, got me interested in, in the topic. And then from there, I started realizing that there are these different mixed states of consciousness, almost what you could call like cocktails of consciousness, where you have different elements of being asleep, being awake, and dreaming, and each of those have different brain patterns, but say if you have something like sleepwalking, that's a classic example of, something, of someone that's having uh, um, one of these kind of hybrid states where part of their brain is awake, they're able to see with their eyes, their motor function is working, they're able to move through space, and yet parts of the neocortex that govern rational thought and memory are completely asleep. So it just really lends itself to a lot of strange and bizarre things happening out of, out of these kinds of states. And that um, is mainly what I explore in different chapters in the book, different um, types of, of this uh, mixed state, things that include hypnagogia, which is the state just before you fall asleep and just after you wake up, as well as something like lucid dreaming, where even though it's the REM, a rapid eye movement dream state, the mind wakes up enough to realize that the person is in a dream itself. So it's, again, that's a kind of mixture of awake and asleep. The general manager at the gym I go to, a guy named Dino, had asked me about uh, sleep paralysis, and whether or not you thought whether there was a paranormal aspect to it, or do you believe that it's all just between the ears? Mm-hmm. And, and, <laughs> and did, you, did you have a take on that? Well, I was just, uh, he asked me to ask you about it, because uh, oh. <laughs> he, was, he was interested in sleep paralysis, but he was questioning whether or not it was something a person was being targeted about, like, say, a paranormal creature of some kind, or whether it was all just between the ears? You know, in, in my book, I, I try to walk kind of a middle path, and, and that's something I've adopted from all these years of working for Coast to Coast and hearing a lot of strange things night after night. So I think... I, this, the way I go about it is to be open-minded, but also to be skeptical mm. and look at things critically, but not in a complete closed mind sort of way. So I, I look at both possibilities or different possibilities in my book. The um, neurological explanation is that it's a kind of REM intrusion, and and that makes some sense because when you're when you're having REM dream sleep, your body is frozen. So 
you don't get up and start acting out your dreams. And in sleep paralysis, your your body is frozen. But what happens is your your eyes are open and you're actually seeing into your real space, your real bedroom. And then what happens is you might see some kind of nefarious entity start forming in the room or coming towards you. And that's definitely a, a really bizarre and perplexing aspect about sleep paralysis because the experience of these beings is totally palpable. It, <laughs> they definitely seem like this is a real entity, and it is completely different than waking up from a dream. So I, I think there's, there's different ways to look at it, and um, all across cultures throughout history, they've come up with different kind of supernatural explanations. Uh, if you want, I could, I could tell you some of uh, what those are from different countries. Certainly, yes. Um, for instance, in uh, Japan, they call it the uh, Kanashibari, and it's depicted in folk tales and manga as a magical power used by monks to immobilize people and animals. And it's also in uh, popular TV shows. And most Japanese people know the word, and some believe that it's caused by spiritual beings. Some don't. Um, there is the Haka Po in the Hawaiian Islands, where it's conceived of as an avenging spirit warrior from the ancient days. And in this case, there's kind of an auditory spin on it where they hear the heavy sound of footsteps and drums approaching. And they become more fearful as it grows near because it's said that looking into the warrior's eyes will bring death. And um, in Germany, there's uh, the lore of the Alp a demonic being or elf that attacks or paralyzes people in their sleep in what's called elf druki or elf pressure and they're said to be able to enter a person's sleeping chambers through the keyhole of a closed door so there's a whole bunch of these it's really fascinating to mm -hmm. to look at these these different cultural interpretations that all have uh, kind of a supernatural spin uh, more recently I I saw an explanation by uh, a neuroscientist uh, named V.S. Ramachandran that uh, I thought was really interesting to consider, where he was talking about that the brain has a certain uh, way of conceptualizing the body that it's, it's built into the brain. He calls it like a homunculus, like this vision of the body as a specific figure in the mind, mm -hmm. and that during sleep paralysis, because a person can't move their limbs, that they somehow project this other body out in this, this kind of uh, mirror, mirror neuron thing he refers to and talks about it almost like, um, like a phantom limb syndrome. And that kind of reminded me of something in my book where I ran across a theory from a, a lucid dreamer named Lucy Gillis, who talked about how in people's uh, dream states they might astral project at times, and it's this idea of what if the astrally projected body is trying to get back into the physical body, and there's kind of a momentary dual consciousness where the person laying in the bed opens their eyes and and it's the astral body that's <laughs> trying to get back in, kind of pounding on the chest of the person. So I thought that was kind of a mind-bending thing to consider. But um, so, so I guess to sort of um, get back to your question, I think it really is a lot of different ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. I think if you're more materialist and, and don't believe in the whole ghost and spirit type of way of looking at things, you, you would just think of it as more of a neurological glitch, kind of like um, an out-of-sequence REM experience that mm -hmm. happens during the dream state. Do you... Have, have you ever had uh, sleep me? paralysis, Chris? Uh, not that I can remember. Uh, I okay. will, I've... It's actually not too uncommon. It, I think maybe 30 or 40 percent of the population will have some wow. experience of it at some point in their mm -hmm. lives. Do you believe in magic and witchcraft? 
I do. Yeah, I think there's definitely evidence that there are uh, elements of that 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 uh, can be can be seen. I've, I think that the kind of witchcraft that guests have talked a lot about on coast to coast seem like they're used a lot for people's to um, enrich their own lives in in ways for personal growth and and things like that. It, a lot of it seems related to this idea of kind of new age tenants of trying to manifest things in your life that that you you desire or you want to to bring into your life. So it's uh, I think it relates to the power of intention and um, strongly kind of willing something that that you want to happen and focusing on that that kind of energy. Is is that uh, were you asking the question in, in a different? Uh, no, different frame. It, this was actually questions from the manager at the gym, uh, Dino. Oh. <laughs> he's he's become one of my big fans, and he listens to the show. And whenever I tell him what the upcoming show is, he'll he'll come up with a list of questions to ask. So okay. <laughs> he's. It, I always ask my audience if they've got a question, if they've got something they want to hear, send me a note, and I'll I'll make it happen somehow. That's great, yeah. The old hag. It's definitely the, go ahead. The old hag, is that connected to the incubus? Yes, definitely. Uh, the old hag is, um, and that, um, when I was going through some of those different countries, the old hag is something that came out of New Newfoundland up in Canada. And uh, this uh, sociologist, David Hufford, was one of the first to, write about the phenomenon and point out that sleep paralysis wasn't necessarily something that was associated with psychological problems. It could be an experience that healthy people have. And he tied it into these this various uh, lores that are built up, built up around uh, the, the mythology of these different beings. And Old Hag uh, is, is one that's quite popular and he was mentioning, I thought it was pretty interesting that um, that the word haggard or ha- haggard is uh, could well have its its uh, etymology coming from this experience. But over time, people have forgotten that that was the the initial connection mm-hmm. of that word. Um, also, what's ca- interesting, kind of related, is the word nightmare, which up until um, the 1800s actually referred to sleep paralysis rather than the, how we associate it now with anxiety, REM dreams that, that usually wake us up. I tried finding a pair of those incubus shoes on the internet, and they claim <laughs> they claim they never made them out of the factory. But uh, I imagine they're probably worth a pretty penny today. Yeah, um, what you're mentioning is something I, I uh, pointed out in in my book uh, uh, from Shelley, Professor Shelley Adler's research. She was saying that um, that Reebok came out with this line of shoes called uh, the Incubus, and uh, I guess they sold fifty thousand pairs, oh, and they then sell them. they 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 realized like okay, the the actual meaning of incubus is not really a cool thing to be <laughs> putting on women's shoes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Imagine somebody got a stern talking to, if not a demotion, after that one. <laughs> well, it's an interesting point, though, of what I was saying about some of these words, is that the original meaning gets can get lost over time, and people just have different associations. Still, you'd think, we're going to... Put thousands and thousands of dollars into producing a shoe. Maybe we should look up that word first. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's a bit of a head scratcher. What surprised me, you mentioned in the book that Freddy Krueger from the movie Nightmare on Elm Street was actually based on a real event. Could you go into that a bit? Sure. Um, There is something called sons or sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome and there were a number of cases of this in in the early 80s and it was afflicting southeast asian immigrants uh, a lot of them in the los angeles area and wes craven the director and writer 
read about these some of these cases in the L.A. Times, and that is what uh, inspired him to create this idea of of the Freddy Krueger character that visits people in their in their dreams and nightmares. And what was happening with these these young men was really quizzical because they were generally in good health and quite young, and they uh, were dying basically from what seemed like some kind of extreme nightmare. And it actually related to the Dab Chow, which is what they called their particular sleep paralysis demon. And they had, even though they had immigrated to America, some of them held on to some of their traditional beliefs. And one of them was that if they didn't practice sort of the old ways of religion that included some animal sacrifice, that they might be more likely to be visited by this Dab Chow demon that comes in, in the sleep and, and paralyzes. So um, it was kind of uh, uh, still, though, that, that they were dying seemed uh, hard to fathom because people have had sleep paralysis since antiquity and not died from it. And so this professor that I mentioned, uh, Shelley Adler, she did some interesting research and talks about the nocebo effect. It's kind of like placebo's evil twin, where instead of uh, like a sugar pill making you feel better, it's a belief that will uh, make you feel worse. So it was a combination of that, and then she also uncovered this um, rare heart defect that uh, people... Uh, certain Asian people might be more likely to have called Brugada syndrome. So it's it's believed at this point that the people that died from this uh, syndrome had a combination of uh, nocebo and this uh, heart defect. Mm. Led to an interesting movie coming out. Unfortunately, they yeah, made... yeah. I mean, Freddy Krueger is, is one of the kind of last great classic. Uh, evil uh, characters that it seems like they they have not had as that many iconic horror figures uh in recent years. I think they've pretty well beat it to death though now. What are they up to like 20, 30 episodes? Oh, of hmm. yeah, the the the, re, the cycles, yeah. yeah. Leave it to Hollywood. They a... they have something that is a success and so they'll do it again and again and again until it's no longer worth watching. But that's just me. Yeah, I, th- I think they even had a Freddy versus Jason movie. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that one. But uh, I guess it goes back to that old uh, Universal uh, Films tradition of uh, of yes. uh, really milking their their monsters like Frankenstein the, versus the, Dracula, uh, Dracula and Wolfman, Dracula versus, and uh, getting them together with Abbott and Costello. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but okay. speaking of uh, of vampires. Um, I, I mention in the book that there is sort of a parallel between the idea of vampires and sleep paralysis that mm-hmm. uh, I thought was kind of interesting. Could you go into that a bit more? Well, just the idea that um, that people are visited in their sleep and that uh, they are sometimes paralyzed by this this figure that uh, is kind of draining them of their of their blood or energy and uh it seemed like the whole um idea of it might have been inspired or tied into people's uh, sleep paralysis experiences in the book you talk about parasomnia uh could you tell the audience a bit more about that and whether or not it's actually dangerous to do what people used to say it was Uh, you mean to to well, parasomnias are uh, emotional or physical abnormalities that uh, that accompany sleep. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a big wide swath of, ah. of 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 things. Some of the better known ones are things like sleepwalking and sleep talking. And the ones I looked at in the book were things that I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, that are mixtures of these different uh, brain, brain states. And I, I guess, are you asking about, is it dangerous to wake someone up yes. in the, if they're sleepwalking? Yes. They say that it can be in terms of, like, startling someone because they're, they're really um, operating from a different 
space in their mind. They're, like I mentioned, the rational part of the brain is turned off, and they might be more triggered to a fight-or-flight thing that uh, could, could be violent in rare circumstances. Uh, generally, I think what I've heard is, is just to sort of gently kind of guide the person back to bed. And uh, um, I think the old uh, lore was that, um, that if you woke a person up when they were sleepwalking, that they could be disconnected from their soul mm -hmm. because that would be said to be traveling elsewhere. <laughs> but uh, Of course, there was that girl on the crane. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fascinating case, uh, I think, from the summer of 2005 in London, where originally they thought uh, there was a teenage girl on top of this 130-foot crane that was about to commit suicide. But instead of uh, being perched on there to jump, they, when they looked closer, they saw that she was curled up asleep. So... Um, the firefighters that came to the rescue were a little perplexed because they didn't want to startle mm -hmm. startle her. Speaking of of waking someone up from from that kind of state, and they uh, ended up finding some relatives of hers and were able to ring her mobile phone, and she was rescued without injury. But uh, the case kind of um, it demonstrates uh, this almost a daredevil ability of some people that are sleepwalking to just do amazing feats that that if their rational mind was working, they, they would not do to, to mm -hmm. just climbing a 130-foot crane. That you've got people... That people have been known to fly helicopters, mm -hmm. motorcycles, drive cars. It's really kind of astounding. I wonder just how it's possible for these people to do things like that, but I guess I've never experienced, so it is incredible. Yeah, like I said, it's it's these motor functions are are working so that they and their eyes are open. It it's really um hard to completely understand what is going on inside their, their mind. Uh one thing I, I ran across was um some research um that talked about the zombie within us, that a lot of our actions are almost automated, and a lot of that is motor function. So when you're awake and driving a car, you just are riding a bicycle, a lot of that is, is fairly automatic. You just, just kind of do it. So I think that with sleepwalking, some of that is, um, is just kind of dialed in where they, it doesn't really require them to, to think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. You, all, you talked about the sleep-talking man. Could you uh, tell the audience about that guy? That was interesting. Yeah, that's this uh, fellow named Adam Leonard. And uh, his wife, Karen, started recording his, 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 uh, his sleep-talking. And uh, he's a British fellow, and when he would sleep-talk, he would just say these really sort of funny but but nasty remarks, and so um, she she started recording them, and they were really um, fu so funny that she started doing a blog, and people started following it, and then it led to like various merchandise where they um, have like uh, uh, coffee cups with his. Uh, with his sayings on them, it's it's stuff like um, like I'd rather peel off my skin and bathe my weeping raw flesh in a bath of vinegar than spend any time with you, but that's just my opinion. So it, it's bizarre to imagine someone in their sleep kind of mm. rattling off these funny but <laughs> nasty remarks, and uh, eventually he stopped doing it. Uh, um, Karen speculated that they were um, trying to immigrate to the U.S. and he might have been under a certain amount of stress that was was causing him to uh, do this sleep talking. But she mentioned that his personality, his waking personality, was nothing like <laughs> the voices that were uh, emerging from him hmm. uh, under this sleep talking scenario. His website is still up. I checked it out. It's called... It is, yeah. Sleep, sleep Talking Man. Yeah, yes. so there's audio samples of a lot of his quips and stuff. 
Mm -hmm. It's sleeptalkingman.blogspot.com. And you can still get the T-shirts and the coffee cups there if you'd like. Cool. And it's it's worth listening to. There's not a whole lot there. It won't take you years to listen to, but it is funny. Yeah, and uh, it, sleep talking is is definitely, uh, I think, one of the more lighthearted of the parasomnias. Mm. That uh, it doesn't seem to cause any any problems. It's it's just rare, though, that you find people that are so cogent mm-hmm. that you know are making these these clever remarks. Because I think. Typically, sleep talking is more babble-like, where people say things, these kind of word salad things and stuff that doesn't really make sense. And uh, so it's interesting when uh, you can find these cases where it's it's really more uh, theatrical. And uh, they have apps now. There's sleep, uh, sleeprecorder.com that uh, is voice activated. So it's a fun way to uh, find out if you're <laughs> if you're sleep talking or not. Hmm. You might be surprised. What is REM behavior disorder? Oh, REM behavior disorder? Yes. I, I I think I called that in the book like the funhouse mirror of sleep paralysis because what you have here is instead of the body being paralyzed while you're in the dream state, that paralysis doesn't work. So essentially, people are are acting out their dreams. And what's typical with these kind of states is that the dreams tend to be violent. So it's, it's really somewhat dangerous to be sleeping with someone that, uh, that has that uh, REM behavior disorder. There was one case I mentioned in the book where the fellow that was dreaming uh, was imagining he was, or dreaming he was in a tent and a skunk had gotten in so he was trying to physically remove the the skunk. Meanwhile, in in his actual bed, he was pulling on his wife's long hair, and it was like he was trying to drag drag the hair. So she was, <laughs> of course, woke up. And uh, anyway, they were people that eventually sought help in a sleep clinic for this problem. A lot of these parasomnias are are treatable conditions in one way or another now. But I think in the past, there was uh, shame and embarrassment about a lot of these conditions because I think people just feel weird about doing these things unconsciously. But when it comes to something that, you know, or someone can actually get hurt, it really is worth mm-hmm. looking into to trying to treat it. How about the Minnesota disease? Uh, Minnesota disease, I think, is, is kind of the same same thing, as I recall. The, the Minnesota Sleep Clinic was one of the first to uh, to deal with, with these, these kinds of things. Mm. And I think when it was first introduced, it was so rare and that people hadn't heard of it that they were referring to it as, as the Minnesota disease. But like I was saying before, I don't know that a lot of these conditions that they were so rare, I think there was just a real culture of secrecy around them. And probably with the growth of the Internet where people could start to look up their symptoms and then the growth of sleep clinics in America, I think there's over 2,500 of them now, has really um, just given a lot more visibility to, to these kinds of conditions. Where would you put the cat boy? That was a really interesting case that was um, more like a, a kind of a nocturnal delusion rather than a dream state. Uh, the uh, young man that was um, being observed at a sleep clinic would go into these very specific cat-like behaviors that were um, just enacted with almost an uncanny kind of accuracy where he would be like dragging a mattress with his teeth and um, and it was almost like a fugue state, really, rather than, I think, when they ran like a polysomnogram on him, they didn't find evidence that he was asleep. So that was a case where it was more of a, a strange kind of abnormal psych- psychological phenomenon. Hmm. How about the ambient zombies? That's been a real problem. I think that there is more 
publicity around it now. So some of these things that turned into crimes have lessened some. But Ambien is a popular sleep prescription, and I think in its earlier days, people didn't really follow the directions that closely, and the pharmaceutical company didn't um, clarify things or, 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 or make big enough warnings to people. So what would happen sometimes is that if people would have a glass of wine along with the Ambien, they could get up and start sleepwalking or sleep driving and uh, often get into problems. Uh, there, were, One of the cases I describe in the book is about someone downing Ambien on an airplane and the um, <laughs> flight attendant kind of describing the ensuing chaos of a man walking naked down the aisle and <laughs> having no idea that he's d- even doing that. With and, with all um, the cell phones out there, I'm surprised we didn't see that on YouTube. Yeah, um, well, I was also going to mention uh, I saw it uh, up close and personal. With I was visiting a friend of mine, and he had taken Ambien to go to sleep, and uh, I was up uh, chatting with his niece after he'd gone to bed, and all of a sudden he got up and came into the kitchen and poured these tortilla chips into the sink and started eating them. And we just thought, oh, that's really bizarre. Don't you want to put those on a plate? And so we started talking to him, and he was just kind of like grunting in this (laughs) weird monosyllabic fashion. And it was like almost like this subconscious part of himself that wasn't, you know, like a primitive being not not like a full person and as we thought about it a little more like oh yeah he took ambien like 90 minutes ago and he had mentioned uh that he had noticed sometimes he was sleep eating where he would see empty pints of ice cream the next morning so something like ambien can can trigger sleep eating which is kind of a separate parasomnia Mm -hmm. about the most horrifying part of the book as far as I was concerned was when you're talking about sleepwalking murders. Could you go into a little detail on that? Yeah, it, it was it was a pretty uh, dark area to dive into. Uh, most of these cases are pretty controversial in terms of going to trial where someone uh, has as their defense that, uh, that I was not... <laughs> awake while committing this murder and therefore should be found not guilty. And I think in some cases they have been able to present a pretty good case where they can show that uh, via the polysomnogram that the person has abnormal sleep patterns and that they have had a history. Witnesses can come forward and say this person has a history of sleepwalking and various things to um, back up the case. Whereas other ones, it seemed more like a little bit more like a Twinkie defense kind of thing that uh, I think especially maybe in some of the earlier cases. Uh, so um, it's a really interesting and controversial area of law because people are considered uh, not guilty if they're not conscious enough to realize what they're doing. But um, it, it really is a bit of a gray area when you've got someone sleepwalking to what what extent are they responsible for their actions well you had chief inspector robert ledru who solved that particularly interesting murder back in 1887 could you go into that a bit yeah that was kind of a, a funny case where uh this inspector from uh, paris was called to assist at a, a seaside town in in, uh, in France, and uh, while he was there, they a murder was committed, and they decided to switch him over to help solve that case, and he indeed did solve the case, but <laughs> what was so bizarre about it was that he determined that he was the killer, that he had sleepwalked himself because he had some missing uh, missing toes and found a footprint in the sand that matched his own unique foot, and he had slept 
with a gun under his pillow. And so um, he got on the train and <laughs> turned himself in to, to Paris, his, his supervisors in Paris, and they were quite incredulous about the whole thing. It's like, you know, we can't believe that you would have actually done this and that you're turning yourself in. So they conducted their own test where they put him in a jail cell and left a gun with blanks in it to see if he would do something like that again in his sleep. And indeed, I think on the third night, he pulled out the gun and, uh, and shot one of the guards. So they, they finally, finally believed him. Incredible. How about the 1943 case of Carl Krieger? That was a, a really in, intriguing case. Um, the uh, Carl Krieger uh, had, I guess, what you'd call like a robbery complex, where he was concerned that someone would break into their home, so he stashed guns all around it. And uh, one night, uh, their 16-year-old daughter Joan uh, thought that she heard someone breaking into a window downstairs. And she later said that she saw this large, shadowy man with wild and evil eyes. And she instinctively knew that he was going to kill all the family members. So she went and got one of the stashed guns and sort of madly was chasing him around the house into the different bedrooms and, and trying to stop him from killing the other family members. And in the ensuing chaos a number of shots were fired, and I think it went on for like an hour, and finally she turned on the light in her parents' bedroom, and one of her father had been shot to death and was bleeding out in, in, in the bed, and the mother was still alive. And, and so Joan said, there, you know, this evil man was in the house, and, and um, so the mother said, well, you know, go and, and try to get help. And so um, she left the house, and then... The police were considering it to be uh, some kind of intruder that broke in, and but eventually Joan's story collapsed, and they found out that she was the one that had fired the gun and killed both her little brother and her father. So she was actually tried as an adult, and I think the jury just couldn't couldn't believe that that you know a young girl would commit these acts of murder. So this, again, is one of these controversial cases, and I think it being that it was back in 43, they didn't necessarily have the sleep science that they had have today, but they definitely had witnesses that talked about um, sleepwalking and how this kind of thing was, was possible, and uh, she was actually found not guilty. Just like I said earlier, that was the more shaky section of the book just thinking about how a person could do something like that in their sleep right right and and you're really left wondering uh to what extent were they asleep were they asleep at the beginning and then after some shots were fired did they awaken and, and kind of try to piece together some sort of story it, it's just a lot of different mm -hmm. ways to look at these things, and it's really, it's almost impossible <laughs> to know for sure. You said there were 70 well, cases throughout the world? That's what uh, figure I ran across. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a little hard to, to get an exact number on that. But, and then I think when you have medications involved, like the aforementioned Ambien and different benzodiapans and things like that. There's been crimes and murders associated with those that uh, kind of verge on sleepwalking. Mm. But it's very rare. I mean, yes. I, I think it, it just, uh, it's, it's intriguing to, to ponder when it happens, but luckily it, it's extremely uncommon. Rock around the clock. Uh, Peter Tripp. You were talking about how his, his temperature changed. Uh, you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. That was from my chapter on, on sleep deprivation. And um, this was sort of in the 
uh, Peter Tripp was one of the first to do one of these stay awake stunts. It was uh, for what he called a wake a thon, and he, uh, along with his radio station in New York City, was set up in a glass booth in Times Square. And I believe he stayed up for something like uh, 10 or 11 nights, and he was broad- broadcasting his show live. And the station um, got a couple of uh, psychiatrists to sort of be his minders and make sure that he didn't fall asleep. So it was done as kind of a charity thing, so it was like they were collecting money for as, as long as he stayed awake. And... Uh, so it was an interesting case to study sleep deprivation and what would happen. One of the things, as you mentioned, was his, I think his temperature started going down in the, in the latter days of the experiment, and he was having all sorts of wild hallucinations of seeing all these strange creatures inside the studio. So basically what can happen during sleep deprivation is that um, the REM dream state just starts kind of superimposing itself or mixing into the the waking state. So it's kind of um, what I was saying before about these mixed brain states. So it kind of fits that, that modality. And then he didn't really benefit from it after all anyway. Right, right. Uh, yeah, because he was really trying to get his name out there and become like this super well-known DJ like Alan Freed was at the time, but then Freed and, and Peter Tripp got caught up in that payola scandal that actually happened just shortly after his, his wake-a-thon. J.P. Richardson, the uh, the big bopper, also did one of these uh, rock-around-the-clock things, and he said that while he was awake certain time of the, the episode, he said he saw death but that he didn't think it was that big of a deal. And then later hmm. later he got on that airplane with Buddy Holly and Richard Va- Richie Valance, and, well, he got to see death firsthand, but it's, yeah. it's incredible what Might people what people will do. Uh, Might have been, yeah, kind of a premonition of what was to come. The record holder for staying awake the longest. You talked about him in the book. Oh, uh... Randy Gardner. I, was that, are you ta- the teenager. Is that, are you talking about the, um, the teenager? Or, um, yes. There's also a guy named uh, to- uh, Tony Wright, I think, that uh, did a more recent thing in, uh, in 2007. Now, well, you talked about Randy Gardner uh, staying awake for what was the record at the time? Right, right, yeah. And it was funny because... I ran across uh, on YouTube uh, his appearance on To Tell the Truth, that old, uh, an old black and white uh, clip from uh, his appearance with two other people, and the uh, yeah at the time that was the the claim to fame was was staying awake the longest, but uh, yeah, it's just a high school project. He and a buddy decided to um, try out uh, staying awake. And it ended up attracting a, a lot of national attention, and uh, a famous uh, sleep scientist ended up coming out to observe them. And, uh, yeah, at the time, I think it was the third most reported story just after uh, the Beatles' visit and the Kennedy assassinations in the early 60s. Wow. Uh you mentioned people that went without sleep would see black dogs, uh, especially truck drivers. Right, right, yeah. The black dog is um, interesting because there's legends of it going back like a thousand years in the U.K. of it being this ominous sign of uh, impending death or being at some kind of crossroads. So the thing with truckers uh, generally refers to what's called microsleep, where someone is so dead tired, they've gone without sleep for so long that they have this involuntary sleep, micro-sleep, that can happen up to 30 seconds at a time. And usually what, what precedes this in this kind of legend of the black dog is they'll see a black dog on the side of the road. Sometimes if you just see it once, they'll think like, okay, there's a dog on the highway, that's weird. But then if you see 
the black dog a second time, that's like the warning sign. Like, uh, you need to <laughs> pull over and, and get some shut eye. So, uh, so there's, yeah, this is kind of trucker lore about, uh, yeah. about the black dog. How about sleepless torture? Uh, sleeplessness as, as a form of torture. Yes. Yeah. That, uh, it's very odious practice that, uh, I think they they started experimenting with in the Inquisition and uh, used on uh, people suspected of being witches. And then in more recent times, it, it was used in the, the gulags in uh, in the Soviet Union and then uh, in, in places like Guantanamo in combination with waterboarding and, and things like that. But uh, what was really haunting to me about uh, reading about it from people like Solzhenitsyn and some of the other people that described it, that there was nothing, I uh, just broke a person down so thoroughly that they would sign anything or do anything just to get sleep, you know, far more so than eating or drinking or anything like that. It would just, they it, going without sleep could just, you know, break a person down that much. Mm. So it really is a, kind of a cruel and unusual form of torture. I think the army. But they is... would devise the. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I think the army is very much into that because the whole time I was in basic, I don't remember getting any sleep at all. <laughs> it was more just inadvertent, or mm-hmm. they were just waking you up really early. And... I would get to bed at like one o'clock in the morning and get up at four. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what's kind of interesting about the whole sleep deprivation angle is that the uh, fellow that I mentioned, Tony Wright, that's a consciousness researcher, and he came up with um, this this fascinating theory about uh, the two hemispheres of the brain and that the left one that uh, is, is more dominant, that governor, governs rational thinking and, and the like, um, can start to quiet down or go to sleep if someone puts himself uh, on a sleep fast, which he has experimented with and wrote a book about. And so under these long periods of going without sleep, the right side uh, has more sway, and he describes having these religious and spiritual experiences and and different things that seem to be um, positive aspects of letting the other hemisphere have have more focus you talked about how birds could do that didn't you in the the book well i mentioned that uh birds and certain animals um like uh sea animals like uh, whales are able to sleep with one hemisphere of their brain while the other one stays awake so it's kind of a smart, convenient thing if you're flying in the air over long distances or, or, or traveling uh, underwater so that you kind of keep an eye out for <laughs> things that you need to track while the other, uh, the other side sleeps. So uh, it seems like a good mm. adaptive technique. And uh, it's, it's similar in a way to what, what we see with stuff like sleepwalking and some of these other things where you're seeing these odd combinations of the brain being awake and asleep. You said something... One thing what, that... Uh, uh, go, go ahead. There, there's a delay between you and me, I guess, so... No, just go ahead and keep keep talking. Oh, I just ran across this, this funny statistic about um, they... I guess you can't really say for sure whether animals dream, but they are able to see that they go into REM states that are similar to ours. And the platypus supposedly has the longest REM of any mammal. It's an REM for eight hours at a time. Jeez. So that's some amazing dream sequences, potentially. You mentioned demons in the dark. Could you tell us about that a bit more? Demons in the dark. Um, that is from my uh, chapter on uh, psychic attacks, where I was looking at the idea of what might happen in terms of when we're sleeping and are we more susceptible to outside forces. Um, the demon in the dark. Can you refresh my memory yes, on one? Uh, uh, there was a woman who was, there was a woman who was seeing uh, a dark, shadowy creature in the room with her. 
Uh, yes, I think um, it was an interesting uh, combination of uh, of thinking that someone, her husband, she was, well, she was originally diagnosed as having some sort of schizophrenia, and the husband was, you know, trying to help her, but was skeptical about her condition, and she had this complete personality change, almost like she was, she claimed to be sort of haunting, being haunted by a demon, and at one point, um, they were staying in a hotel, and he was awakened and saw his wife sitting up and actually saw this kind of vaporous vision of this, this kind of hideous man that was like floating above her. So um, even though she did eventually, she was eventually institutionalized, he came to believe like, okay, <laughs> she's not making this thing up. So I was sort of exploring the idea of whether people can be haunted, particularly in, in dream states or these um, states surrounding dreams and sleep by, by different types of entities. It would be a very convenient time to be attacked since you're, you're not there to really defend yourself. So some of these negative entities could uh, find it a time to do something. Yeah, it's something that is, is gives you uh, cause to pause. Uh, one one of the surprises for me in my research was the idea that even though REM the REM dream state is is what we think of as normally dreaming, there is activity going on during non REM or deep deep sleep or slow wave sleep they call it. So there's actually content going on then we just don't remember it. So if there is some kind of interaction with with outside entities, we basically would have no recall of it if it took place during during that that part of sleep. Some some of the uh, cases of sleep paralysis that I reported on included people that instead of um, going into sleep paralysis and seeing sort of a a negative entity form in the corner of the room, when they awakened and were paralyzed, there was already a being that was attached to them and kind of feeding on, on their energy, and the being seemed sort of surprised to see them being awake, almost as though they thought that they had kind of free range mm. <laughs> while this person's asleep and has no idea that I'm there. So it it kind of hints at the idea that there could be this whole ecosystem that we're not even aware of um, as to whether it's, it's some kind of parasitic thing or maybe it could be more of a, of a symbiotic nature that in ways we don't understand that this actually isn't a bad thing for us. Mm. What are negs? Uh, that was something that Robert Bruce talked about uh, I guess there's a whole sort of phylum of different types of of these negative entities, whether you consider them to be parts of our subconscious or something that uh, is like an astral entity, some kind of lower realm being that that feeds off of negative energy. How about earthbound spirits? Earthbound spirits. Well, that I mean, I guess that would be in that same category of some, some like a ghost kind of thing that's that's trapped in our realm, and that potentially could could interact. Uh, one thing that I ran across was that in so-called like haunted houses or places that are experiencing things like poltergeists, there is often strange things that happen around sleeping and uh, really vivid, horrible nightmares or levitation of a bed or strange orbs seen. So it seems like a lot of the activity revolves around the sleeping period. So that would give some credence to the idea that if there are these outside beings, this might be the time that they consider people to be more vulnerable and decide to dive in, as it were. Mm. 
you started to mention at the beginning of the show about lucid dreaming, and then we got off on all the other subjects. Do you want to go into lucid dreaming a bit more? Sure. Uh, I think lucid dreaming is this really great untapped uh, thing that people can access. It, it's not super easy to achieve, which is sort of <laughs> the problem, but as I mentioned before, it it refers to when you realize you're in a dream, within a dream, and it really opens up a lot of possibilities that if you're able to maintain that state, you can change different aspects about your dream, you could um, practice different skills, you could uh, conduct healings on yourself and others, you could learn wisdom from different dream characters. It, it really is this um, kind of big avenue of exploration uh, that would be sort of like an alternative form of meditation. And it can also just be like a really fun thrill ride to experience like flying up into the stars and, and things of that nature. Do you have any uh, ideas on how a person would go about honing their abilities? There's a variety of techniques. Uh, one of them involves... Um, it's called like the wake back to bed. All, all these techniques have different acronyms, but um, this one entails like getting up um, midway through your sleep cycle. So say you sleep for eight hours, you'd get up after three or four hours and then stay awake for an hour and then go back to bed. And what that does is it wakes up the brain more. So when you do fall asleep and start dreaming, your brain is, is just a little more agile and might have a better chance to recognize that one is in a dream. There is something called reality checks, which is how you can verify whether something is a, is a dream or not. There's a number of ways to do that. My favorite is, is to look at some text, like whether it's on a wall or a piece of paper, and then you physically look away and look back at the text. If the text has changed, that means you're in a dream. So it's, it's kind of a rush <laughs> when that happens. So one way to facilitate that is to do frequent reality checks during the day. So even though it seems kind of absurd, you know, if you're out riding your bike and you look at a street sign and turn your head and then look back and see if, if the street sign has changed. So if you get in the habit of that, the theory is that you'll you'll do that um, in, in your dream states naturally, and you might discover that you're in, actually in a dream. Uh, it can be kind of hard to maintain lucidity, though, once you discover that you're, you're in a dream, because the tendency is to get a little bit excited, and then that causes you to wake up. So you have to maintain this sort of calmness or neutrality. Mm. Have, have you had uh, lucid dreams, nope. Chris? I've I've realized I was dreaming, but it never uh, never was able to do anything with it. I would I would wake up as soon as I realized it, and it's like, okay, no, so much for that. Yeah, it's it's really tricky. There, there's also um, some supplements that can help. Uh, there's something I experimented with uh, when I was writing uh, the chapter for my book. Uh, it's called galantamine, which has gotten a lot of attention in the lucid dreaming community. And uh, the dosage is a little tricky because if you take like 8 milligrams, I, for me, I found that it just kind of gave me a headache and it was very hard <laughs> to fall back asleep because you would take it, like I mentioned before, sort of in the mid-sleep cycle. But if you, when I take half that much, while it doesn't usually induce lucidity, it makes my dreams smarter. So it's kind of like I'm, the brain is waking up a little more. Mm. So, for instance, if you run across, say, a deceased friend in a dream, normally in a dream, I'm not aware that that person's dead. I'm just like, wow, I'm surprised to see you. But if I was on the galantamine, I'd be like, oh, that's weird, you're dead. <laughs> and then maybe like ask some questions about the afterlife or something like that. Hmm. Is, so I, I think there's... Is that an over-the-mark, is that an over-the-counter medication or is this something you need a prescription for? It's over the counter, yeah. You can get it. Oh. Uh, I got mine on Amazon, but mm. uh, there's all sorts of different 
um, formulas and things that are supposed to induce or help with lucid dreams. What I was just going to say before is the Internet has kind of exploded with an interest in lucidity. So mm-hmm. there's, a, there's different masks and electronic devices that are said to help to induce uh, lucidity. There's some interesting research out of Germany where they stimulate the uh, gamma waves, uh, give gamma wave stimulation rather, to someone that's dreaming. And that, in 77% of the cases, uh, induces lucidity. So I'm kind of waiting <laughs> for the home version of that, because if mm. they could make that safely, that seems like an, an easy way to, to get there. Either that or you turn into the Hulk. <laughs> well, that, that was yeah, a gamma definitely raise. some of this is, don't try this at home. <clears throat> now that your book is out on the market, you've uh, you spent... I imagine hours and days and weeks and months writing the thing. Have you gotten to that point yet where you want to start another one? <laughs> Not really. Uh, I think I need a little bit of longer of a break, but I have some ideas for for a second book. But uh, it's it's a, it's a long journey. Mm. Even after you finish the book, there was a lot of stuff to to deal with with the publisher and uh, I'm particularly excited about the audiobook version that mm. I got to have some input on the casting uh, the narrator is a fellow named Neil Helligers that did a really a bang up job it's kind of got this uh, real sort of um, page turning <laughs> quality mm. sounds like Lionel Fanthorpe maybe yeah something like that yeah he's, he's uh, got some good uh, kind of acting chops to to really uh, kind of just enlivens the material. It's, it's a different experience. I am sure most of your, your listeners um, have heard audiobooks, so it's it's kind of like more of an entertainment thing mm-hmm. rather than um, the learning experience you might get from actually reading a book and, and yeah, kind of taking the information in that way. It's more like you're just watching a movie or something. It's just not the same but, but to fun. listen. No. Where can folks get a copy of your book? Well, of course, it's on Amazon and uh, in uh, retail stores as well and other uh, online things like Barnes & Noble and IndieBound, Books A Million. Uh, I also have a website that uh, has like an order page where I list some of those places I just mentioned. My website is nightmare.land. Nightmare.land? Dot land, yeah, oh. not dot com. Okay. I'm kind of venturing out into one of those new domains. Hmm. And will you be doing any book signings? Uh, any bookstores near you or going on the road somewhere? I'm actually doing a couple of events in California, in San Francisco and San Diego. I'll have details up on my, my website, nightmare.land. No chance of getting down to Laredo, huh? I, I'm not planning on it at the, at the moment, but who knows? <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of off the beaten path. Any, yeah, yeah. Well, I like off the beaten path. Anything you'd like to say before I let you go and get back to your life? Uh, well, it's just been a real pleasure chatting with you, Chris. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to be on your show. I really appreciate it. Well, appreciate you being on. This is Lex Lonehood who is the writer of a book called Nightmare Land. And like you said, you can find it on Amazon.com or any of the bookstores. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree